So I wanted today to um, hopefully change the way you think about your perspective on some things that actually are human rights. And I brought four case examples. I'm not sure we're going to get through all of them. And there's some handouts at the back of the room, which are the tools that I use in order to um, do these investigations. Um, there we go. Um, if you want to email me at the end, I can email you this handout, because then you'll have the actual links. But I think that, um, like I say, I want you to think about human rights as a variety of different issues. So human rights is certainly human trafficking, but it's also war crimes, climate change, migration, um, things that we're maybe getting used to, we can reframe as a matter of human rights. And the first one I was going to walk through is about human rights and modern day slavery, an investigation I did about tracking um, seafood from slaves that ended up in the United States. But I have talked about this investigation before. So can I see a show of hands if you've already heard me talk about this one? Oh, my goodness. OK, let's do this. Um, a few years ago, we kept hearing about um, slavery because people would run away from a boat when they arrived in Thailand. They'd come in on their boat there, and then a, a fishing boat, and one person would run away. And they would end up with an NGO, and they would tell a story about having been enslaved. And we kept doing the story saying, half the seafood in the United States is coming from Thailand. This guy said he was enslaved on a boat for years. Um, and nothing was happening. And so we decided to try to actually find somebody who's enslaved and then track their seafood all the way back to wherever it ended up. And so as these people would run away, and there was you know maybe five, 10 a year, we would do detailed interviews with them and with their um, and with the NGOs to try to figure out where they thought it might be happening. And enough people told us about this one place called Benjina in Indonesia that we decided that it would be worth going to take a look. So the first thing we did was start with some satellite images. And this is um, just a Google Earth picture. But on that handout, I also have some other satellite image resources, including Maxar which will give you satellite images as journalists if you contact them. And you can, again, email me if you wanted uh, more information about that, or you can go on their website. When we looked at Benjina, we saw boats. We saw what could be a processing facility, and then maybe some village area. When we got there, we were in trouble because the people on the boats who we were trying to talk to spoke um, Burmese, and we had come ready to speak Bahasa because we were in Indonesia. But they weren't from Indonesia on these boats. They were from Laos and Cambodia and mostly Burma. So climbed to the top of a hill, sent a text at the one time that we were, allowed to sit, were able to send a text, and got our colleague in Burma, in Myanmar, Esther, to begin the long trip to this island. You know, a plane, and then a small plane, and then a boat, and then you just charter a little boat out to the island. There was no landing strip there no regular ferry. But when she came, the story opened up because the men were so excited to hear somebody who spoke their language. And the stories they told was that they had been recruited in their villages in Myanmar and um, paid large fees to be recruited and had then um, been taken to Thailand where they were put in a shipping container and held until they had new identifications with a Thai name and a photo, making it look like they were from Thailand. That's because they would not be allowed to be fishing in Indonesia. We asked to see more of these guys, and they took us out to a graveyard because they're property. And so even when they die at sea, the captains would put them in the same hold where the fish were held, the freezers, bring them back to Benjina and bury them to show that this, they had not run away or somehow escaped. And then we went inside the processors and found that there was plenty of men inside of cages. These were the ones who, when their boats 
came to shore, there was a fear that they would run away. So we had found somebody who's enslaved, and then we, we, this is when I became very obsessed with what type of fish is it, and what's the boat that it's going into, because we need to track it. And also, now that we have seen that men are being held in cages, we have to work as absolutely fast as we can to get them out. So the boat was the Silver Sea Line. You see the writing on it. it. said Bangkok. We figured it probably would go there, but we used the website Marine Traffic. There's some, for those of you who have just arrived, welcome. And there's a handout at the back with a number of links that will be useful. Um, and so we tracked it every day as it came into port just south of Bangkok. And when it got very close, we set ourselves up there at the port. And when it arrived, even though we had been tracking the boat, I did have that, you know that journalist moment when you're like, thank goodness, <laughs> it's true. It was the Silver Sea Line, the one that we had you know, seen leave. Um, we were hiding in the back of pickup trucks in in uh, Thailand, they had shells on them that were shaded. You know what a shell on the back of a pickup truck? Um, have any of you in here been to Thailand? It's very hot all the time. Winter is hot. Being in the back of a pickup truck was really hot. My colleagues were without uh, enough supplies. Um, but we watched them unload into these big trucks. And I want to tell you this methodology is one I use again and again and have used before um, of following the product from a product of forced labor. So then we followed the trucks down the highway into different factories where the seafood then was going to be processed, cut up or somehow processed. And then I used customs bills of lading to track where it would go. So this load from a shipper called Kingfisher in Thailand was going to Beaver Street Fisheries in Jacksonville, Florida. The way that we look at these are through some websites that are on that handout, Import Genius and Pangeva. They're brilliant. You can put in your own countries and find out what products are either being made from your country and being shipped to the United States or going into your countries from the United States or about 20 or 30 other countries as well. They have India data. Um, they're a little expensive, but if you email them and explain who you are and what you're doing, they'll work with you. Um, they'll do you a favor. And particularly, if you have, are in a country where you have some manufacturing and you identify labor abuse, you can see where that factory is shipping to. Um, and this was frozen wild-caught snapper fillets, and I, we had seen one of the fish going onto the boat was snapper, so it worked for me. We did this about 40 times with different companies because those trucks went all over the place and we lost a number of them on the way. We, we had two trucks, but they were moving quickly. But we, we did it enough times that we had enough companies in the United States to show that the fish was going there. And so I ended up at the Boston Seafood Expo where all the importers are. And I created a dossier, a little file, and I had the picture of... Benjina and the man in the cage and the boat tracking and the bill of lading for their particular company. And I made the mistake of telling the organizers at this conference, at this expo, who I was and what I was doing. And so they put a, a post out to everybody at the conference with my photo and said, Martha Mendoza is at this conference and she's writing about labor abuse. <laughs> and so <laughs> then when I would walk out, like people would not um, talk to me. And so our photographer and videographer made me sit in the press room while they went out on the floor and got the images they needed and all the free samples. And then the next day, I would go out and try to talk to people with this dossier. Um, it was partly important to get their information, but I felt like it was critical to not report that these companies had imported seafood from slaves um, without really walking them through how I know that. Here's some of the brands that we tracked to. Um, oh, there's a lot. You're not going to recognize all of these, but certainly Walmart 
Cisco is a company that delivers to all the jails and schools and universities. And then this cat foods are just everywhere in the world. But then I asked my colleagues to go look for the products at their local markets. Brands in the United States like Piggly Wiggly or, well, Whole Foods, everybody went to Whole Foods, um, Publix. These are more regional, Winn-Dixie, so that, so that my readers and viewers would say, not, not Winn-Dixie, because this, people have a real loyalty to their local supermarket chains. Harris Teeter, we're getting there. Um, so, okay, so then after we pub, so we published this story with all these company names, and I had to contact all these companies, every one of their um, public affairs, and if I couldn't get public affairs, I would call their CEO and um, tell them that the story was coming and try to get their response. And they all said, well, we don't want this. This is not, you know, we don't want to have labor abuse in our supply chain. Um, so we published. The story was very explosive. It was, you know, New York Times, Washington Post, NPR, had lots of interviews. All the um, ABC, CNN, everybody ran the story. And so within a week, the, the Navy and the fishing ministry went to Benjina and began trying to take their stories. And we said, if you're asking them their stories in front of their captain, they're going to get beat up or killed for talking to you. And they said, no, 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 we'll take them. And so we said, well, all of them, and yeah. And they went out with bullhorns and speaking in Cambodian and Laos and um, Vietnamese, they, they, and of course, Burmese. And they said to this whole area, they said, anybody who has been um, trapped and wants to leave with us can come. And um, they began running down to the dock. They came out of the forest. They came out of what we thought were empty buildings. Men were coming from all over, and it was... We were trying to text and then write the story remotely because we didn't, and publish as it was happening. So, you know, our first version said, 12 men are going to be rescued today. And then it was like, 150 men are going to be rescued today. And as they realized what was happening, the, there was a whole different um, feeling that came through them because they had been gone five years, 10 years. When Esther had gone to the island and met them, they had handed her pieces of paper. They'd shove paper in her hand of their parents' village and phone numbers, and they were realizing they were going to go home. And they asked them, you know, how many of you want to leave? And it was everybody wanted to go. Um, and so, they, so they, they had so many men, 400, 800, and eventually that number went to 2,000 and more. And they had so many men that they actually commandeered the fishing boats that they had been enslaved on, and they took the oil and gas from those boats and the actual boats, and they rescued all these men and took them to another island in Indonesia where there was a hurricane rescue center. And um, then the International Organization for Migration began having to identify all of them. Um, and, and I'm jumping, this is, is a quick version because I want to walk you through different human rights types of stories completely. But in interviews, these men began telling us that in the time between when we published and when the authorities came, a number of boats had already left. Um, and so we tracked that big boat, the Silver Sea, had another sister boat called Silver Sea Two. And so we tracked that using marine traffic and saw that it was somewhere around Papua New Guinea. And so we asked a number of places with satellite cameras in space or with cameras in space if they would take a photo of that area so we could try to find some more of these boats. Maxar, which is on there, is the one that took the photo, and they will do this for you. So if you can think very creatively about how to use satellite imagery, um, we use it a lot now for human rights, right? Before and afters of different places. They took this photo and called me and said I should get on a plane and come to their office right away. And this is like a $50,000 gift, and I was very disappointed. But then when I got to Boulder, Colorado, their analysts zoomed in and showed me this, and they said, we think this is these boats. And they're just, instead of loading it in Benjina, they're just loading it at sea into that Silver Sea too. So we took this image, and we sent it to Myanmar and asked the men who had been on those boats if they could identify this as their boats. If you've lived on one of these for five years or eight years, even though that image might not look very clear, they could tell exactly which boats it was. And so the Minister of Fishing for Indonesia, Ibu Susi, worked with Australian authorities because they were in Australian waters, sent a drone over, got better images, and as soon as the boat entered Indonesian waters, they 
seized that boat and um, rescued these more, more men um, who were baffled and wondering what was going on. We followed one man home. He'd been gone for 22 years. His, his mother and sister had maintained a shrine the entire time with a lit candle. They never gave up on him. 22 years later, he showed up. But on that day in that village, they had heard that some of their boys were coming home. And so while well, his reunion was very um, moving, others were, uh, others were less so. What I'm going to do, I have four different case studies on human rights that are very different. So what I thought I'd do is just take like three or four questions after each of these, and then at the end I'll take more questions. But does anyone have any questions briefly on, on this one that I just walked through? Yes. Oh, wait. What kind of abuse they have faced uh, during being enslaved? I mean, I can mm -hmm. imagine being deprived of food, not being given salaries, but I would like to hear more about that from you. Okay, so what kind of abuse did they face? Uh, let your mind go to the worst place it can go. On Benjina, there was a um, hill, and at the top there was like a pole, and they would tie people to the pole and beat them. Um, they would... Uh, Mint Nang was actually, uh, he, was, he was chained to his deck in the sun because he had, tried to, he had jumped off the boat. Um, and then he tried to swim away at one point, And then they, he realized he was going to drown, so he went back to the boat. And so then they chained him to the boat to make an example of him. Many of them had scars. He had a, a big dent in his head from having been hit so hard. Um, they were, they were, it was like losing a product if something got, got killed. So they would try to keep them alive, but they really didn't think much of them. So, yes. Uh, what? <laughs> oh, one moment, one moment. The first question is, how were you able to record uh, interviews with the people behind the back of those who are in charge with them? You reached the boat. How were you able to remain clandestine? How were you able to re use uh, videos or cameras? Uh, did you manage in your investigation to reach the people who sold these men from their original countries because they were sold. If you, you uh, tracked the products, but who was responsible for selling them in their homes? That's a lot of questions. Um, so who, who, going backwards, who sold these guys in the first place and did we find them? But also, um, how did we interview them when they were behind bars, et cetera, in this dangerous situation? So I'm going to start with that. It was very hard to interview them. And in fact, the man you see in the cage, that interview was done by a sympathetic dock worker who we showed how to use a GoPro. And then he walked up and he held it like this, because we had already been thrown out, obviously looking very different from anybody else there. Um, so then the other thing we would do is we, we uh, rented a boat and would go around behind the boats and try to shout up at the men. It made an incredible difference to have our reporter Esther Tucson with us because she was Burmese. And so she would say, like they would try to flirt with her and she would say, knock, knock it off. We have an American news organization here and you need to tell your story right now because this is your only chance. So. It was very difficult to talk to them, and we left under threat, our, our AP team. Um, and we tried to find out who had done this, who the recruiters were who cheated them in the first place. We did not, but the courts did do some of that. In, at least in Thailand, there was accountability. So there's recruiters in, in Myanmar, and we never did track them down. But when there was 400 men when, or 500 men still in the Hurricane Rescue Center, we put out a survey to all of them asking how did you end up here, who recruited you, were the police involved, who was your owner, et cetera. And we used that data 
to um, track to some Thai owners. And so many businesses uh, in Thailand went out of business and um, people went to jail also. Yeah. Okay, one more question on this. And I'm happy to answer questions at the end also about it, but yes. Hi. Um, prior to going to the fishing expo, to the fish expo, um, were these companies aware that they had been working with essentially slavers and human traffickers? And then when it came to the stage of informing the public relations and CEOs of, of these various huge companies in the U.S., um, what kind of responses did they give you and was it difficult to get any kind of response out of them and did they show any kind of awareness of what had been happening? prior to you, to you approaching them? So there's, in, in certain industries, medical devices in Pakistan, cotton in Kazakhstan, fishing in Southeast Asia, it's known that these are vulnerable to human trafficking. And so what most of these companies had done is hire auditors to make sure there wasn't human trafficking in their supply chains. And so the response when I came to them was, we have auditors, I'd like to show you our audits. Um, and also, we never would tolerate human trafficking and we're very concerned about this. But I've actually tracked seafood to Walmart four times now from four different locations. And the fourth time I did, I, I actually went out to breakfast with the spokeswoman and I said, you know, I'm a soccer mom. Like, come on, but how is it that you guys cannot track this? And their their methodology is very different, right? They start with the supplier, and then they go from, they ask that supplier, who's supplying to you? And then they go to those suppliers. Well, the ones who are trafficking people are not, they're not gonna be telling the company, oh, we also had to source some from here because we didn't have enough. So there's some blind spots. Okay, I, as I said at the beginning, I wanna shift your paradigm, and Aisha and I were talking about this. This is a story about migrants, right? That's what was happening, these migrants looked like they were just working on the boats. And so in my own community, I have had my own eyes open to, hey, these people who are working here may or may not be here under, under protected um, services. And I actually found human trafficking going on in the tuna industry in Hawaii after this story. So I, I ask you to take a look at the people who are working in your communities who may not have um, the language or the, um, the power to s step out of their situation and say, you know, I'm a maid in this house and actually I'm being abused or not being paid. It's human trafficking anytime somebody can't leave, forced to work. Big red flag is if someone else is holding their passport. So now I wanna switch to human rights and war crimes. And I'm looking at a war crime that took place 50 years ago. In South Korea, um, South Koreans would talk about a time when U.S. troops came and fired guns and killed hundreds of South Koreans. And um, the U.S. Embassy said it didn't happen and that U.S. troops weren't there at the time. And the South Koreans every year had a celebration or a ceremony to mark this event at this place called Nogunri where they said that um, hundreds of people had been killed. They described this was during the Korean War, which in the United States we call it the Forgotten War. Is a thousands, tens of thousands of people lost their lives. Then in South Korea, the U.S. was an ally. We were, U.S. came in to help South Korea, but immediately began telling people to leave their villages and, and evacuating them quickly because there was a concern there would be fighting that was going to take place coming down from the north. And so people described fleeing down their roads and then being told that they had to get up on a railroad track and then from the railroad track, they said the Air Force came, the US Air Force, and strafed them. These were our allies, and that they all took shelter in this tunnel at Nogunri. And so my colleague in, in South Korea, Sang Hun Che, wrote a story about this, and he sent it to the editors. And the, edit and the third paragraph said, the US government says this never happened. And the editor said, we can't write a story about all these people being killed when the US government says it never happened and it's just their word against, against the government. So I heard them talking about this and began working on it. The survivors had wounds. They had 
shrapnel and bullets, the people who talked about it. She had it in her hip. This other woman had lost an eye, and they described being little girls at this place. Um, this man talked about actually um, they, that they were in this tunnel for three days and three nights, and that when anybody made any noise, they would fire at them. And so uh, they actually had to put a, put, like, kill a little baby he told us about. Um, I began going to the U.S. military archives, and because this forgotten war was so put aside, the entire archive was classified, but I was allowed to look at it, and if I saw something I wanted, then I could take it to the archivist wearing these gloves and say, can you declassify this? And they could look at it and declassify it on the spot. So we found maps, and then we began finding... Um, things that said things like this. It is, re it is reported that large groups of civilians, either composed of or controlled by North Korean soldiers, are infiltrating U.S. positions. The Army has requested that we strafe all civilian and refugee parties that are noted approaching our positions. To date, we have complied with the Army request in this respect. Do you understand? They're saying... Yep, we're gonna, this is the Air Force saying, we're, yeah, we're, we're hitting all those civilians. We found more, including, you know, on dates, no refugees to cross the front line, fire everyone trying to cross lines, use discretion in case of women and children. These were U.S. Army orders in an allied country. And I'll just show you one more. If refugees do appear from north of U.S. lines, they will receive warning shots. And if they then persist in advancing, they will be shot. And this is signed by Dean Rusk, who was an assistant secretary of state. These had never been seen before. And I said, we got the story. We're done. And I you know, called my editor and I said, we found it. We got the smoking gun. You know, We got the documents. And he said, and if you guys are, are there any editors in here? So investigative editors are the worst, right? You think you have the story, and then they're like, yeah, that's, that sounds like you're onto something. Go get more. So what he said was, go find the men who did the shooting. And this took weeks and weeks more work because every unit had left a, um, every day, a couple times a day, they would put where they were with a map coordinate. And so I got these big maps blown up, and I put stickers on the maps to figure out which unit would have been at Nogunri on this day. And then we had to go to the National Personnel Records Center, which is a place that has all the lists of people who are in a particular military unit. And then we began calling these men who were in their 70s and 80s. We had a list of about 50 and asking them about the war. And they were alcoholics. They were, I don't remember what happened. Um, it was the wrong guy. We didn't have the right number. But on the 29th call, I talked to this man who told me, I said, you know, I'm working on a story about an incident that occurred during the Korean War. And it would have been in early July. Um, the civilians have described some, some issues that happened. And he said, well, it was on July 26, 1950. And I said, actually, yes. Um, and he said, we killed them all. And I said, what? And he said, yeah, we, we shot them all that day. And I said, well, how do you remember that? And he said, it was my 20th birthday. I'll never forget. So then I said, well, are you still in touch with other people who were there? Do you have reunions and talk? And so in due course, we had about 12 men who described shooting. This story also blew up very big on the cover of the New York Times and many other, all around the world, people heard about it. And um, in Korea, there was big protests and demonstrations because they wanted the US government held accountable. And they did have investigations from the Pentagon and from the South Korean military where they were able to confirm this. At Nogunri today, they have extricated all the bullets from this place. And they have built a large museum commemorating it. Um, they also made a very popular film in Korea so that everybody in the country knows about this. Their top, most famous actors volunteered to act in this film. And I got to go meet some survivors there two summers ago. 
every year they have a big ceremony and we try to have somebody from the team who did this reporting, myself or Sang Hun or our other colleague, Charlie Hanley, attend. So this was, did it change the world necessarily? No, but it actually changed the, their lives to have this recognized both in the United States and in um, South Korea before all of these people who are aging passed away. Questions on this before we go to the next one? Oh, there was three of us who did the reporting on that. Sang Hun in um, South Korea and myself in New York. And then we brought in a master journalist, Charlie Hanley, when we began doing the interviews of the veterans because Charlie himself was a veteran of the Vietnam War. And he coached me through how to do the interviews. Um, and we scripted them so that we wouldn't be accidentally leading people into telling us something. Um, and then he also was a master writer, and he really helped us frame, frame this story. Uh, although we argued with editors about it for 10 months, AP actually tried to kill this story. Um, so. Oh, and the reason why they tried to kill it was because the top managers felt like this is what happens in war. There's always civilian cl collateral damage. Why do we care about this? And I think that just like that seafood slavery with this one, by having meticulously tracked it, we were able to make the point that it, it did, we did have this. It's not, we're just not saying that in war in general, bad things happen. We're saying this happened right here and here's the documents. So, yeah, what, well, go ahead. Um, following the interviews, were people ever held accountable in the United States for this? Oh. <laughs> so Congress promised a scholarship fund, and the president expressed regrets. He did not apologize. And that's very important to Koreans to actually apologize. Like in their language and in their culture, an apology means something very, very different than expressing regrets. And the you know, multi-million dollar Pentagon investigation found that it happened, but they said that there's no reason to believe it was ordered. Now, the men who did the shooting all heard orders. Um, but we went to talk to the guy who did, would have been doing the ordering, and he was like, I don't remember anything about this. I was keeping diaries, and I was like, can I look at your diaries then? And no, I don't remember anything about it. But then after we published, he called and just said, uh, I'm not saying whether it happened or not, but you guys did a hell of a job. So, yeah. Did you have a question? Okay. Okay. Now this, yeah, one more. Go ahead. Just about you said when you were how how did you go about framing the story, and what did what did you identify to be the most useful in actually telling it? I, I can tell you this: we did not get to write the lead. Um, the editors wrote the lead. I, again, we argued about it for 10 months. We actually um, brokered a deal to sell it to a magazine, at which point we were told we would be fired, and then we had to weigh whether that was worth it, and then the union got involved. And The first line said it, it was a story no one wanted to hear. Um, and I was like, yeah, it really pissed me off. But it, it also won a Pulitzer Prize, so, you know. Um, uh, we argued a lot in framing the story because the discussion was what is more, why are you wanting to believe the white soldiers who did the shooting, their word more than the South Koreans who were shot at? Why is their memory and witness testimony more valuable? And then what about the documents? Where do they fit in? And so it was quite a juggling act to. Um, do all that in under 2,500 words. And it was a very heated discussion. Um, I often find that, you know, if you can get the American to say it, then, then all of a sudden everybody else can be believed. And I, I just think that's not, uh, not great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay. Human rights and climate change. This is a whole area of academic research and understanding. And I want to talk to you about it in terms of wildfires because um, as somebody from the Western United States, I've been covering wildfires for a long time, but all of you are now going to have to start doing this. Um, 
I love, love, love forests. I was so happy to see some forests in Jordan. Um, and they are, this is just from last year, um, or just last summer. The, this is becoming, because of climate change, we're going to have more and more wildfires. And people have a right to have clean air and a healthy climate. And in the West, it's gotten so bad that two years ago, two summers ago, we actually had what they called a fire NATO because the temperatures were so hot. It's like a fire and a tornado. The temperatures were so hot and the trees were so dry after years of drought that it exploded. And the people who were in the fire NATO described a sudden darkness falling over them and then all of a sudden like an explosion, like a bomb went off. And going into these neighborhoods right after the fire, you could see like a house didn't get burned, but a huge tree came and landed right in the middle of it, or cars had rolled down the streets, and then other houses, of course, had burned. Um, the town of Paradise, which was one of a place I really enjoyed, completely burned up in a course of just a few minutes, because usually a fire is going maybe five kilo mm, two kilometers an hour, and there it went through in like 10 kilometers an hour. And they, they um, every, just about every house burned down. So the reason why we're all having more fires is there's stronger winds from bigger storms because the bigger storms are coming off a warmer ocean, and that means more fallen branches for wildfires to consume. We also have extreme wet weather, and that is priming the forest for fire by growing more fuel. Um, Climate change is going to lead to more hot days and so compared to cold, and so that hotter temperatures, higher temperatures can um, dry things out after that. And drought and warmer springs mean there's smaller snow packs, at least in, in west, and so you have drier forest fuel. These are just some of the reasons. So I just want to give you a real briefer on how to cover and investigate wildfires. Before, if you're in a region where you know you're going to have some, or you're, you were like, like Lebanon, like what? This place has got wildfires now? Source up. There are fire scientists and f who are doing modeling and research, and they may not even be in your country. Find climate scientists and ask them what their predictions are for your summer. And find public health experts because your air quality is going to dramatically change. So this is beforehand. Also look at what sort of rules there are for houses, um, if you, new homes being built. Um, because with fireproofing, houses can definitely survive. Um, and then also where we live, there's a whole push now. People have to clear out around their houses to protect, um, to protect the homes from building. This is because we're increasingly building houses in fire zones. Okay, during the fire, <laughs> watch out. Um, stay out of the way of the firefighters. Don't endanger the residents, and um, stay. And then report the news as the fire's happening. In California, we're allowed wherever we want to go as news reporters during an emergency. There's, you know, that yellow tape or the cops who block everyone out. We show our ID, and they're like, "Go on in, go burn yourself up, journalists." <laughs> um, and so some reporters do just that. Um, this was a half a million dollar news truck in a fire they got burned up. Well, during fires, I tend to focus on the evacuations and particularly how they're evacuating people who can't get out themselves, like hospitalized people or elderly people. Also, evacuations, um, their animals are everywhere. In that paradise, f that photo that I showed you of that burned out city, I went there right after the fire and I kept picking up cats and putting them in my rental car because cats apparently can survive a fire. And when these fires come, you just can't evacuate your pets. You cannot grab them. And so um, looting begins almost immediately because there's these communities that are closed off from post-fire, but people will go in and try to steal. At that Paradise Fire, two days after the fire, they shot and killed somebody who was looting. Um, I use flight radar to track the airdrops or the chemical drops. That's one of the flight tracking um, websites on your piece of paper there. So you can, tr you can follow the planes and helicopters. We also use the same satellite photos to show when it's getting close to cities and also smoke plumes. We have public information incidents that give us a lot of details. 
And during the fire from those, we begin trying to figure out what the source of the fire is. And so for us, I go into public utility data to see if they are talking about where fire started. And in this case of that one in um, Paradise, we found that the utilities, the electric companies are warning they've observed by aerial patrol damage to a transmission tower um, at the time that the fire ignited. So they had been flying over the transmission lines and seen the tower was having some damage at this place called Polga. So I went to Polga, which is this beautiful little resort, and the owner was there and she told me, yes, that they had told her to, that they had flown over right as the fire was starting and told her that the transmission lines were sparking. Now I knew that I had this story because there was a press conference with all the firefighters and police and everyone else and the utility company called PG&E. And I went up to the vice president of PG&E at that news conference while this fire was still going and said, I was just now in the town of Polga and here's what the owner tells me. And he started doing this to me on my chest and I was like, I think we got this. I think this utility started this fire. Um, you can see these high, these high transmission lines are very vulnerable to sparking. Okay, after the fire, investigate. What are the economic and social costs, costs to the cleanup? How, and then you can also go back and say how effective was the response. Scandinavia, Sweden had huge forest fires last summer and they dropped a military bomb to try to put out the fire. And their investigative reporters went back and found that it was a half million dollar bomb and that that's not a good way to put out a fire. Um, and, but you can see, like, are we putting down chemicals? What are the, what's that going to do? And also what medical issues are starting to come up? This is in the Paradise cleanup. What kind of, I mean, it's just a wasteland. How are they going to deal with all the chemicals out there and all the dangerous items now that could still explode? This is from above that town of Paradise. How are you going to rehouse all these people? Many are now living in homeless, homeless in tents more than a year out. Um, and, and then where all this stuff has to be hauled out, taken to a dump. And so how, how is that going to happen? Like just really get in the weeds about what happens after a fire with all the cleanup. Um, donations pour in. There can be fraud. There also can just be a big mess. People, tr you, you know from other disasters when people send donation, sometimes it's the least helpful thing. Um, scams to raise money um, start to pop up after any type of natural disaster. And yep, that PG&E sparked not just that fire, but a number of fires and um, is now going through bankruptcy. We, we've looked at what type of chemicals they use. This is what we use in California mostly. Um, and then the long-term effects of smoke, how many kids now have asthma in the public schools. And then the people who fight fires, if you're going to have these more and more fires, your firefighters are going to be exposed to more and more smoke and they get very uh, unique brain cancers. Um, and so then you can also be covering that, the effects on the people fighting the fires. We have to, I have time for a couple questions on this and then I'm going to go through the last one. Yes. The link to these. Uh, could you put the link to these articles so we can read them? Yes. Yes. Or at least the title so we can find them? Yes. What I want to suggest is that I, somebody pass around a piece of paper and I get all your emails and then I'll just send you a group email with links to the articles and also the tip sheet so that you have that as well. Could somebody at the back maybe start a piece of paper? You can even use the back of the tip sheet if you want. No, because there's a lot of AP photos, and so, yeah, uh, yeah, sorry. Um, yes? I'm sorry, I keep thinking about the Forgotten War you have spoken about, <laughs> so uh, I have We're a question. Back. Okay. Uh, you told us that you have looked and went back to the archive. Uh, here we don't have this opportunity, we can't do this. So what are the alternatives mm -hmm. to do something like that? How we can write a story without these documents if we don't have them? Mm -hmm. So in the US National Archives and in EU archives and in other countries that do have archives, you find researchers from all over the world because there may not be a archive in your country of this, but there may be 
it may be that somebody in, in the US government was also writing something about something happening in another country. So when you go into the archives, you see groups of researchers from all over the world. So uh, the one thing you can do is try to tap, was there any other country involvement in this and would they potentially have an archive? I, are there any reporters from Israel here? I think that they have um, pretty clear archives. And so, and there are military records kept. So if you can, I, I know, I know. I mean, Rukmini walked out with like bags of ISIS documents in garbage bags, right? Like it's, it, it is very rare. Um, yeah. Okay. Sorry, one moment. On climate change, how can we prove uh, that uh, these fires are the result of climate change and not any human role? In the Middle East, we have many violations of human rights, but sometimes publishing will just escalate uh, such human rights violations. If I write uh, about uh, torture in the prisons, this will increase the torture. And if I use uh, uh, pseudonyms, then this will weaken the reporting. In the West, there is a respect for human life. But in our part of the world, if we write about it, it means more repression. Um, I wish there was more respect for human rights in the West, and I wish there was any here. Um, so you are asking how to report this because it can make the problem worse. And your first question was, how do you attribute a particular event, fire or anything else, to climate change? Um, this is where we find the experts very helpful. We, we, you can never say this event was because of climate change, but you can say globally there's more wildfires by going to those climate scientists, whether they're in your country or elsewhere watching this. Um, and they can, they can tell you with authority that there's more wildfires in general because of climate change. Um, in terms of how to report the human rights and not have it get worse, I only can suggest partnerships and that's where AP, Associated Press, we're almost like we already have partnerships because we have people in all these different countries. So I, I haven't um, lived here, but I lived and worked in Mexico and out of Honduras and also Thailand. And those regimes, you're not allowed to, uh, particularly Thailand, you're not allowed to criticize anybody. Um, so we would publish out of New York and we would not put our name on it. Um, and so I think the best, the best option, if you can find it, is to have partners who are not here, who you were reporting with, but they're the ones who are publishing. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. One more back there and then let's, yeah. I will speak uh, in Arab. I have two questions. The first question, what's the use of human rights investigative reports in some countries of the Middle East. These uh, reports are not taken seriously. And no radical change has taken place as a result. Nobody uh, is interested in them. How can the journalist overcome this big problem? You work for long hours, for days and months on a human rights uh, story, and ultimately nobody devotes uh, any attention, especially those officials in the uh, Middle East region devote any attention. And secondly, access to information. Do you have ease in access to information that helps you? So we have, a, um, the questions were what, what's the point of working ourselves to the bone to cover human rights when uh, nobody cares? You, even if you manage to you know, courageously publish something, still nobody's gonna care. But you also said you don't see any radical change and change is so slow. It took 50 years in South Korea for those people to have their story come out and have that truth speak to power 
Um, and so you never know when that, when that tipping point is going to come. And also, uh, this next story I'm going to tell you is about human rights violations in the United States, that it's very slow and very incremental. But I do believe it makes a difference, and I do think it's our calling. I mean, I think we all could have jobs which are easier and pay better. <laughs> and we're doing this because we care about this stuff. Um, so. So this is my last one, and just like I was asking you to think about climate change or war crimes or human trafficking as human rights, I, we, um, in the last couple of years, have begun turning to the way immigrants are treated in the United States as a violation of human rights. Um, in the United States, in the last year, 70,000 children have been detained. 70,000 away from their families, locked behind doors in shelters or um, detention camps. They are there because they're immigrants. And so this is, um, it's been known for ever, <laughs> for centuries. This was a, a king who did a study where he separated the babies from their moms to see what language they would speak when they became old enough to talk. But the babies never, grew up to do that because they died, because they were separated from their families. Um, in the United States, we have a legacy of this with slavery that continues. We have continual trauma in our black community today because kids were separated from their parents generations ago, um, well documented. And we also have this in the United States with the American Indian schools, Native American schools, where kids were ripped from their parents and sent to these schools and forced to speak a different language. and um, Again, that legacy has led to a very separate and um, challenged population of Native Americans who are still working to recover after this trauma. In the United States, um, in 2018, the Trump administration put in place a policy to separate kids from their parents when they arrived at the border. If they come seeking asylum, um, they then take the children away from their parents if they come for economic refuge, whatever reason. Um, and they took thousands, and they would first put them in these processing centers called, they call them the ice box, because they're very, very cold. And um, at this point is when the kids start being very traumatized. And then they move them into these shelters where the average stay was about 90 days. Now for a kid, you might think, like, if I got locked up in a shelter and I have enough clothes and food and it's 90 days, I'm okay. But for a kid, they can't foresee that there's ever going to be an end to this. And they are become increasingly um, disturbed. There's entire, they're called toddler <laughs> shelters or um, tender age shelters we identified. When we identified all these using... Um, yeah, government records, but also government contracts. So we could see, like, I, I'll just search government contracts now for children. And then people started leaking to us because we were reporting on this. And we now have a source who provides us with a database of every single kid in custody and where they are. Not by child, but this shelter has 180. This shelter has 450. The US government lost track of whose kid goes with what parent in hundreds of cases because they were just taking kids, <laughs> and it's a different federal agency, US Customs and Border Protection taking them than the US Immigration Service. Now the courts, we have a lot of um, very brave lawyers who have fought and fought and changed these, but they continue to separate kids. This is at a place in Texas that had 3,000 teenagers, um, and their soccer balls kept going over the fence. Um, we've interviewed a lot of these kids after they came out, as well, we made a frontline documentary about it that aired on November 12th. Um, so this little boy, this three-year-old, is being taken to a foster program. That's another way that they do it. So if they have little kids and they don't have enough detention shelter beds, they'll put them in foster care programs with another family who is getting paid um, thousand dollars a month to take care of them, and the. The family takes the kid during the, day, during the night, but in the day they take them to a program where the kid is there from eight in the morning till six at night, and they're just all together in a very depressing space. And then the foster family comes and takes them home. 
Um, this was inside of one of the detention centers, one of the camps. Um, so the reason that they keep them there so long is because they say that they have to fingerprint and identify every adult in a house before they can return the kid to their parent or their aunt or whoever they're trying to go to. Under the Obama administration, this also could happen, but in that situation, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement would try to get the kids back as soon as possible. What's happening in the United States is that these are now increasingly private. And so there's, and they get paid like 500 to 750 bucks a day to keep the kids in these places per kid, um, which I've argued like, just put them in a hotel. <laughs> but, um, and so there's an incentive, do you understand, for the private company to keep them there for a longer and longer time. Um, we found this woman on Facebook. She was in, from El Salvador, and her name was Ara, is Araceli Ramos. And she had been deported, and this is not an uncommon situation. She was deported, but her daughter, Alexa, was still with the foster family in Michigan. And the foster family decided that Alexa would be better off never going back to her mom because um, her mom, who had carried her in her arms, thousands of miles to reach the United States because they felt that this was a safer and better situation and they fell in love with this lovely little girl. So they went to the local courts and they convinced a local judge to terminate her parental rights so that they could begin a formal adoption. And this was another story that we did where we showed with this one case that this is now possible for this to happen and we highlighted a few other situations where this has happened. Again, I mentioned there's a lot of courageous attorneys involved and um, with their help, Alexa is now back in El Salvador. Um, so with that, let's, let's open up a conversation about covering human rights. I'm not gonna lay another issue on you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, it, it just uh, beggars belief, to be honest, that uh, a country like the United States, can, this can happen in a country like the United States. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> Steve Miller is in the White House and he is behind these policies. And yeah. John Kelly, who was a military general and then went to the White House, actually was an owner, part, like part of an owner of one of those companies that began getting into the child detention business. So we're just starting to comprehend corruption in a new way in the United States. Right, right. But I mean, I meant in terms of the civil society and the human rights activists and the organizations and all that uh, effort that they have been doing, accumulating the experiences over decades and decades. I mean, it seems that not much they could do in a situation like this when a president or an administration is determined to abuse the human, right, human rights and not to uh, respect them. And especially in a case like this where a girl, uh, where a mom um, severed her legal status with, uh, regarding her daughter and she's taken away from her without regard to her own humanity and her own human rights. I mean, yeah, I mean, I. I am from the Middle East and I work in this part of the world and we see lots of these kind of things and we understand the context. But when we look at the you know, modern democracies and advanced country, rich countries, uh, we really look for good examples and this doesn't help that much. But of course, with people like you and, and, and others, it's, it's, uh, it's inspiring, but it just, it's just... And depressing. It's both. depressing, yeah. exactly. But, um, I mean, there, there is a federal judge who has said, said to the Trump administration, you have to reunite all these families. And we have this organization, the ACLU, who have fought time and again to get the families reunited. There's legal clinics at Yale Law School, Columbia Law School, many law schools where the students themselves are teaming up with the biggest corporate attorneys, like the wealthiest law firms, and they are suing the federal government. Some of these kids who are separated, um, 
they're suing for two, three million dollars, and already the federal government has had to pay out. So there's pressures from all directions, right? Like when it starts to cost them money, maybe that's going to have them reconsidering. Um, our reporting on one private company that was getting more and more contracts that had John Kelly on the board just shut down a huge detention camp. Another one that we were writing about, that one with that soccer ball, it became a campaign stop. Everybody running for president had to go out there and give a, a speech. Every day there were protests. Um, so I do think it's what's happening in the United States under Trump is frustrating. It's also important to note that it was not a perfect place under Obama either. Like there was, they still were separating kids, um, just not for 90 days. Um, but, but I do feel like again, this, we as journalists, we have our role to play in in writing these things. Yes. So I'll I have a question. I come from Palestine. And with regards to your coverage of war, there uh, we might have similar things in our region. In case the witnesses die, uh, we've been in this for over 50 years. After 50 years, in case the witnesses uh, have died, uh, as you know, we have many uh, crimes that took place in 1948. I'm talking about uh, the Palestine-Israel war that dates back to 1948. So it's uh, uh, over 71 years. And it's really hard to find witnesses to talk about this because most of them have passed away. And even those who are still uh, alive cannot remember, cannot recall anything. They were maybe one or two years old back then. So as a journalist, what are the alternative uh, to uh, having um, uh, a witness, a living witness? So what's my other option? So she was saying that um, she, she has the same issue in Palestine with aging witnesses to war crimes. And what are her alternatives if they're quite old, can't remember? or I would guess also are so traumatized that perhaps they're unable to talk about it if they're alive. Um, you, you know, I don't know, but I wonder if the United Nations has some historical data about what was happening during that period, whether they were running investigations or had any investigators on the ground at that time. I would be very curious to know. And then what other countries were potentially had somebody on the ground at that time. But I don't know. I mean, that's a, that's a very tough one. And also, I would think it would be hard to be looking at historical war crimes while you're still in a state of war. You know, it, it's all, in, in South Korea, things are, things are pretty healthy. They have a pretty healthy democracy going. And so then you can reflect on what, what happened. And I, uh, but I do think, like, you have to understand those crimes in order to understand what got you there. I just think as a reporter, I would be, same thing with this immigration, like you just are reacting to what's happening right now in front of you so much, I'm sure. Yeah. So, um, I am a human rights defender, not journalist, but because of the question that came also from our friend in Palestine, that's why we, we document violations, and we believe it's a power, not, not to protect civilians now, but also for justice and accountability in the future. So we will never reach in Yemen, for example, a point that we don't find witnesses. We already do this, at least in the current war in Yemen. Uh, so I believe, just like you, it's a very slow uh, uh, process, uh, but it has impact. But at the same time, from our work, we just discovered uh, that the uh, avenues of accountability is very limited internationally, not only in the US and also in the EU. It's very, very limited. It's, it's the whole world is designed in a way that uh, um, enhance impunity more than justice. And I know it's a very long process also, but you as journalists who are working in the field for many years, have you thought of this should be changed. 
do you think it's part, because we started to feel as human rights defenders, it's part of our work to change the system, to do a revolution inside this system so we can do something regarding accountability. Do you think as journalists that it's part also of your work? It's interesting because we, I think that journalists see human rights defenders as advocates in a way that we don't see ourselves as advocates so much as reporters. So um, I think that we have a similar interest in human rights, but um, our, we are communicating to engage the public and you are um, perhaps more trying to influence policy in a way. Now, I'm not saying I don't want there to be accountability. I just think we maybe see things slightly differently. And I do know when we're working with human rights organizations, the more that, that um, the more specific they can be with us with their information, the better. So the more evidence-based and not hyperbole-based helps journalists tell their stories. Um, I don't know if everybody would agree with what I'm saying, but that I, I see us as having slightly different roles in a healthy democracy. Yes. Thank you so much for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, my name is Henriette. I'm also a Palestinian journalist. Um, in a situation where human rights abuses are ongoing and injustice sort of becomes the norm, um, there is a sense of fatigue from both the readers, but editors as well, who might think, oh, we've already reported the story, or we've read about this before. Tell us something new. Do you have any tips on how to deal with that? Because there is value to documenting even something that's happening over and over again. Um, how can we tell it in a way that still grabs people's attention, that still makes it you know, interesting for editors to pick up? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> we, th we think about how to frame our pitches all the time. Um, I think the first thing, though, you mentioned is that how fatigued we get with this stuff. And it's, I think that that's really a real biological, physical experience and that we have to, you know, studies show you have to go rejuvenate. You have to separate and, and take time away if there's any way to do that. Um, in order to get the energy to, to come back at it. it. I also almost always work with other people so that we keep each other fired up and also can break, give each other a break. Like, you know what, I think, I, last week I was talking to somebody who was very upset and I said, I, I really think you should just take the rest of the day off. I don't, I don't see how you're gonna be productive today and just, just go do something different and, um, and leave. <laughs> and, you know, and so sometimes saying that to each other I think is important. But in terms of convincing or selling our stories with our readers and our editors. I think the more granular you can get in terms of uh, human characters, in terms of evidence, in terms of context also. So, for example, we can say kids are being taken from their families, but then when I got that number a few weeks ago that it was 70,000 in the past 12 months, and then I, you know, my editor was like, huh, and I said, that would fill an American football stadium. Like, that's... A, Think of that all full of babies and toddlers and children. In our country, if there's a kid, if my kid is neglected, we have a whole system to take care of them. So how could we possibly be doing this to these other kids? So I think those can make a difference. Should we, why don't we take one more? This is a long session. And then um, if people want to talk, we can just gather up and talk. Is there any more question? Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. It's again uh, for the last feature, uh, I mean, the last investigative report that you uh, present for us. Uh, have you tracked, while you're doing your investigation, have you tracked, because you want to see also the effect, it's not the number that are affected now. Have you, have you tracked, like, uh, after, how long, how, when did this start? I mean, which year? So, how old are the first people who were taken and like separated from families? Have you uh, tracked like what happened to these people? Like they get affected, they get traumatized, or I don't know. So you make it more strong. Like this will happen if this continues. There's there the American Academy of Pediatrics, which is a very big organization of 
thousands and thousands of pediatricians is now making a true peer review study of this group of kids to find out what will happen down the road. But they, ha uh, they have already been putting out warnings, as well as offices within the US government are putting out warnings that this is a very bad idea. You'll, you can watch congressional hearings where people in you know, the public health officers are saying this is not a good idea to do to these kids. So I think that we'll kind of leave those studies to the experts, but we'll definitely be reporting on it when it happens. Okay, thank you. Everybody have been so patient. I need to thank our translators who are brilliant and um, have facilitated this conversation that we couldn't otherwise have. And let's, if you want to stay and talk, we can just stay and talk. So thank you. Mm -hmm.